can you encode multiple categories at the same time? Now, this is a really important question. I see a chair, I think about it as a chair, but actually we have so many neurons in our brain that we're thinking about it in many different ways at the same time. And so our conscious subjective experience is very much focused on kind of the dominant interpretation. But in fact, our brains are actually under the hood encoding many different ways. So if it's red, we think about red, we think about different kinds of things. If it's modern uh, versus traditional, you know, all these different ways of categorizing a given chair, those things are all happening in parallel. And if something on, on one of those other dimensions that's maybe not the main one we're thinking about right now becomes relevant, then um, our brains can very quickly latch on and amplify that aspect, that kind of way of categorizing the information. And uh, that allows us to be very flexible. So a big aspect of our flexibility and ability to think about things in different ways comes from uh, this parallel multiple ways of categorizing that are happening simultaneously in our brains. So this is really uh, the notion of distributed representations. About a thousand different ideas bloom, kind of uh, embracing diversity, uh, having many different things happening at the same time. Um, and that diversity is really r enriching for our uh, mental abilities. And so each uh, neuron has the ability to respond in a different way. That ability to respond in a graded way to different stimuli, also having many different neurons responding to a given stimulus, is really this concept of distributed representations. And that gives you a much more powerful, flexible, uh, efficient way of encoding information in the world compared to having a single neuron active that is, has to summarize everything. And so here's an example from real neural recordings. This is from recordings in the brain of a monkey that is looking at these different stimuli. And uh, this is from Keiji Tanaka's lab in Japan. Uh, they showed this monkey this kind of shape, and this happened to be, at the time they started this recording, kind of the best stimulus of the ones that they happened to be looking at for driving the activity of this neuron. And so we see here kind of a histogram, uh, sum of the amount of spiking per unit time uh, for this one particular neuron in the brain of the monkey. And whenever they showed it this stimulus, you got this pretty robust kind of response there. And interestingly, if you showed a very similar stimulus in terms of overall shape, but missing this kind of nose-like feature coming out of the side, you got no response, strikingly zero response. Likewise, if you, if you just show the nose by itself, no response either. If you put the nose in the other direction, no response, basically. This one right here is just absolutely fascinating, right? So it, it really can't be a square nose. It has to be a roundish type of nose. Um, in fact, just the kind of presence of that feature by itself, those kind of junctions around the nose area, so to speak, um, give you a pretty reasonable response, like 50% of the response uh, just by cutting off the back part is not, not totally ablating the response. Um, but again, the shape, exact shape of that nose feature is really critical for this particular neuron. So these very similar kinds of shapes are not cutting it. Half of the nose doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera. And then they actually found that uh, a slightly more demure nose uh, gave even more activity uh, up here at 1.36. So, you know, even more than their kind of baseline response. But clearly, over all these stimuli, you're getting a graded pattern of responding. And this is inevitably what you see when you look at neurons in the brain, even if they have these kind of very strange high level, very sensitive feature detection kind of properties, they still have kind of graded responses over some hard to define dimensions of overall shape. So this goes back to the idea as we talked about in the previous chapter, that there are these patterns of synaptic weights and you're essentially taking these kind of complex visual inputs and projecting them along the dimension defined by these weights. And although we do always try to emphasize thinking about these things in these kind of behaviorally relevant, simple kind of categories, what you actually see in the brain often enough is actually a bit more like this, that it's not so clear exactly what this neuron is encoding. I mean, obviously noses are important, um, but a top-down view of a nose like this, is that really the most behaviorally relevant thing that a neuron could be focusing its attention on? So it's a little bit strange. Uh, on the other hand, 
this really is the dominant mode of responding of neurons in the higher level kind of object recognition pathways. And we'll actually see this when we look at our model in chapter six of how object representations learn. And so in this kind of schema, it's, it's not actually essential that you get the dimension exactly right. So you can project along a dimension that's kind of closely related to this dimension, some angle in high dimensional space in relation to this particular dimension. And it's still, it gives you enough information to understand kind of what's going on. And especially if you have multiple of these neurons, again, with this notion of a distributed representation, you can actually piece together and pull out the right information, even if you don't happen to get the exact right kind of uh, perfectly vertical uh, partition of this space, so to speak. The overall combination of all these different uh, dimensions is really what matters overall. And this is data showing us how we have these kind of distributed representations. You re remember this stimulus here, number two, there was a different neuron that actually responded to the other direction of the nose. In this case, that was firing here and over here. And so what we're actually looking at is a map of the cortical surface of the monkey um, in the monkey brain, again, in this uh, infratemporal cortex area. And you're seeing that individual neurons responded to different patterns of shapes uh, across all these different areas. So these, these are each different kind of populations of neurons. Um, so you can see the same shape drove activity in different areas and each individual area had a response potentially for multiple different shapes. So this one right here was responding to both one and two. Over here you have neurons that were responding to one, two, and three. Etc. And if you were to show a lot more shapes, you would get a much broader sense of the overall distributed encoding of information across all these different areas. And inevitably, this is again what you see when you look at, at patterns of neural firing. There's a vast uh, kind of what we call an overcomplete encoding, is another term that people use, a very um, redundant code in some ways. So individual neurons. Um, are responding to multiple different shapes, each shape eliciting multiple responses from multiple neurons. Each one is kind of pulling out some aspect of the overall shape. And if you put them all together in this combination, you can sort of infer the overall shape that you have. Uh, there's some indication that some of these features may have some kind of topographic organization which is to say that nearby regions have similar patterns of responses. This is not universally found, um, and there's some debate about this, but um, there's, there's some indication that there may be some kind of more systematic dimensions of organization and topography, uh, this kind of mapping of features onto different regions of the, the brain. Here's yet another kind of representation of these distributed patterns. Uh, here we have responses in red showing the response to this kind of complete kitty. Um, here's uh, in blue the responses to just the head of the kitty. Um, and then if you just get rid of the faces and everything, in yellow you see the responses for just the head outline itself. And so some neurons here, for example, um, are responding to everything. Others are selective to the entire kitty object. Some are just to the head and the kitty, et cetera. So these are kind of sensitive to eyes, et cetera. And so it is interesting in this case that you only get a subset. You never see something that's responding only to the silhouette, but not to a more complete image. Um, similar results here from the fire extinguisher. It's not just uh, rhesus macaque monkeys. Uh, the human monkey also shows the same uh, response. So these are recordings of human brains in a fMRI machine. This is very influential data from Jim Haxby's lab, uh, one of the first studies that really showed how we, in our brains, encoding different visual objects using a broadly distributed pattern of neural firing. And it's a little bit hard to tell because this is recording differential levels of blood flow but um, further studies have really shown that this reflects in a remarkable detail the, the underlying patterns of neural firing in these areas. And you can see that there's a broad range of different areas that respond to faces, a broad range of uh, areas that also respond to houses. Uh, we have chairs, our favorite category down here, uh, as well as shoes across all of these object categories.
you see a broadly distributed pattern of firing. So every area has some level of response for these different stimuli, and um, each stimulus is represented across all these different areas. But because you get these kind of graded responses across different neurons and across different brain areas, you can kind of triangulate and interpolate and see what object you're looking at by looking at the overall distributed pattern of activity. And that's exactly the same thing we do to infer color. Um, you break it down in terms of these different components and, and encode uh, the overall color that you're seeing in terms of a combination of activity across each of these different tuning curves. There are some interesting cases of evidence that look like uh, there might be some kind of localist cell in our brain, which is to say a neuron that has a very specific pattern of neural firing. The classic example is the grandmother cell, um, this notion of a neuron in your brain that fires whenever you see your grandmother. We're looking at the Halle Berry neuron. This is a very famous example that was published uh, in recordings uh, from human brains, a very uh, early demonstration where you could actually record individual neurons in human brains from patients who were undergoing testing associated with epilepsy and to try to treat their epilepsy and find out where the epilepsy was coming from. And while they were in there, they were able to record the responses again to these different pictures. And you can see remarkably that this neuron responds uh, to a wide range of different uh, representations of Halle Berry, but also critically, some responses to other people who are sort of related in, in various different ways, uh, famous people, women, etc. And so there is some sense in which, you know, if you really pushed it harder, there's, there is a kind of distributed representation here, a graded response, even though this, is, this neuron does have a remarkable affinity for Halle Berry. And also these are a small subset of neurons. There's many more um, that uh, don't have these kind of very specific responses. And so overall, we know that, that the neural responses are, are much more distributed.